Before we embark on our exploration of critical topics surrounding international development and how it relates to gender, it is worthwhile taking a critical look at the notion of development itself. So what is it? When you hear the word development, what comes to mind? Perhaps you think of economic development and the alleviation of poverty. Perhaps something like equal access to education comes to mind or the fight for gender equality. Maybe something as technical as securing access to clean water and hygienic sanitation. If you thought of any of these things or something similar, chances are you are probably right. Development can mean very different things, depending on who you ask. According to the Society for International Development, development in its broadest sense is a process that creates growth, progress, positive change, or the addition of physical, economic, environmental, social, and demographic components. This all sounds very great, but how do we get there? There are three relatively recent trends in development theory and methodology that we think you should know about. The first is human development theory, which is an alternative approach to thinking about development purely in economic terms. In this way, human development is not only about, say, the gross national product or the median income of households in a particular country or society. It is about freedom and capabilities, what people can do and what they can be. This capabilities approach to human development was developed by Indian economist and philosopher Amartya Sen. For Sen, development should be seen as a tool that enables people to reach the highest level of their abilities, not just through economic freedom, but through freedom of action, freedom to be who you want, freedom of choice, freedom of family. Alongside Amartya Sen, the American philosopher Martha Nussbaum developed the capabilities approach in the field of gender equality and emphasized the empowerment of women as an important development tool. The capabilities approach of human development theory became a basis for the measurement of development by the Human Development Index, which was developed by the UNDP in 1990. The reason why you've probably already heard about this is because of the sustainable development goals in the United Nations Global Agenda to end poverty, fight inequality, and combat climate change by 2030. There are 17 goals and 169 targets that all serve as a joint roadmap for all countries in the world. The sustainability component of sustainable development means making the world a better place for everyone, while at the same time not ruining the possibility for future generations to do the same. It is to meet human development goals while also sustaining the natural resources and ecosystem services on which the economy and society depend. It means keeping the dimension of economic prosperity, social progress, and climate and environment in the mind at the same time. In this way, according to the UN, development is a multidimensional undertaking to achieve a higher quality of life for all people. The third and final type of development theory you should know about is that of post-development. This is a critical theory According to author and activist Gustavo Esteva, we must remember that development always exists in contrast to the term underdevelopment. After all, one implies the existence of the other. After the United Nations were founded in 1945, the term underdevelopment appears here and there in some early technical books and UN documents. However, these concepts gained international recognition and near immediate acceptance on the day the United States President Harry S. Truman took office and issued in a new era. We must embark on a bold new program for making the benefits of our scientific advances and industrial progress available for the improvement and growth of underdeveloped areas. More than half the people of the world are living in conditions approaching misery. Their food is inadequate. They are victims of disease. Their economic life is primitive and stagnant. Their poverty is a handicap and a threat both to them and to more prosperous areas. The old imperialism, exploitation for foreign profit, has no place in our plan.
What we envisage is a program of development based on the concepts of democratic fair dealing. President Harry Truman here expresses a classic case of what is called ethnocentrism. That is, he applies his own Western culture as a frame of reference to judge other cultures, those he deems underdeveloped. By using these words, he constructs a hierarchy of developed and underdeveloped nations, a construct that lasts until this very day. Whether we call it developed and underdeveloped, first world and third world, global north and global south, the sentiment is the same. According to Gustavo Esteva, for people to accept and receive any kind of development aid, they must first perceive and acknowledge themselves as underdeveloped in relation to the developed West. As you can probably tell, all these ways of thinking about what development is and what it does are quite different. However, they all provide us with important new arguments and angles to consider in the pursuit of making the world a better place. It is important to think beyond economics, about capabilities and women's empowerment, as suggested by proponents of human development. It's also important that our efforts ensure the sustainability of natural and human resources upon which our future relies. And finally, it is important to always be aware of hierarchies and power dynamics in development work, especially as it relates to our colonial legacies. I will speak more about colonialism and decoloniality in a later module of this course. For now, we turn to our first critical topic, namely that of the role of the state in development. It is presented by Dr. Aiko Holvikivi of the London School of Economics. Have fun, and I will see you later.